tonight. We got them, Goldie, the Sulk, and JC. Do you have ones you wrote that you thought at the time would be bigger and do better and ones that you wrote at the time that you were like, can't believe they were the ones that blew up? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's always the case because you never really know. Like, uh, I wrote two songs which I thought were uh, both about as good and both on the same subject. One is called It's All About the Pentiums and one called White and Nerdy. And they're both about about internet and nerd culture. And they both had great music videos. And, you know, I thought they both were good. But uh, the Pentiums one just kind of went away quickly. And White and Nerdy became my biggest selling single ever. So you just kind of never really know. Uh, maybe the key there again is self-deprecation. You're you're Ooh. you're calling yourself white and nerdy. People <laughs> like that. That could be. Could be. People are like Pentium. What is that? Um, <laughs> now you did an uh, an amazing, and I remember watching this at, at the time. Um, the your American Pie parody with Star Wars, uh-huh. and uh, and that seemed to be like you were doing that around Phantom Menace time, like right. ninety nine or two thousand. Was that a song that was kind of on your radar for a while? Like, I want to parody this one day? I, I'd always loved uh, American Pie. That was my, one of my favorite songs when I was a kid, but it never really struck me that I needed to do a parody of it. Uh, but when I decided to do, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with the Phantom Menace, you know, because I was thinking, like, what current song could I match this with? And none of the current contemporary songs seemed to work with it. Right. And then I thought, well, you know, Star Wars is such a... Um, you know, a, a franchise with such gravitas. Maybe I need to like do like a classic rock song, like some classic song. And when I thought of American Pie, and I thought of the first line a long, long time ago, oh, yeah. you know, very oh, Star yeah. Wars. You know, <laughs> I thought I have to do this. And the, the song is very long and lends lends itself well to a to a narrative structure and adds has several chapters to it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this will be great. And but I, I heard that Don McLean just never lets anybody do anything with the song. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we I, I we try to get permission thinking that he'd turn us down and uh and he actually said yes so oh, uh, you know it all worked out that's, that's great so your your manager used the michael jackson card probably <laughs> again to your benefit uh, anyway that was that is just such a cool song and did you have at that time any interaction with like lucasfilm or that end of it to, to for the star wars angle or did it just kind of we, we did uh yeah uh, we got permission from uh from uh, george lucas uh, we, I actually asked if I could see an advanced screening of the movie. I got turned down for that. Uh, so the, the, the lyrics, uh, this is not a joke that the lyrics were written before I ever saw the movie. It was written all based on internet rumors. Wow, because there were so many cool. leaks happening online at the time that I was able to piece together the entire plot of the movie. Wow, that's, really that's cool. amazing! Because you make very specific references in that song, yeah. the characters that I, I had just naturally assumed that you had, you know, you had seen it. Another strange question that in in my research of you, uh, was it a particularly tough time for you when that Unabomber sketch came out? (laughs) <laughs> I, I got a kick out of that norm mcdonald's on snl showing a picture of the uh the unabomber and he has had some, some kind of joke about you know weird al yankovic still at large <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no wonder it must have been implanted in my brain that way okay well that wasn't an original thought by me then I, I apologize um now so we talked about the film we've talked about your process your amazing hits how you make us feel is there anything you want to talk about do you have something else i know you've just done this movie you've probably just come off of a press tour for it are you working on another album no i I don't i don't know that i'll ever do another traditional kind of album uh i I, it took me 32 years to fulfill my contractual obligation (laughs) what uh i i I was originally signed for 10 albums which is already like this ridiculous draconian deal and then uh uh, uh, four more albums got added to it so it took me 32 years to deliver 14 albums so now i'm done Uh, oh my god and you know i i I like being able to put out stuff when i feel like it and it was always a, a a bit of a problem to wait around till I had 12 songs and then put them all out at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and on, honestly, I haven't been very prolific in terms of writing new music since my last album came out, but I still like the freedom of, you know, whenever I feel like it, I can just put something out. Yeah, you can really sing Do you find it harder now? that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it seems like everyone was listening to the same music at the same time and now everything is so disparate 
is it harder to land on what to actually do a parody of because things are less universally known? Yeah, and that's there. There are a number of problems on a number of uh, things that have made uh, writing parodies more difficult, and that's certainly one of them. Because in, in the '80s, there was more of a monoculture. Everybody watched MTV. Everybody was intimately familiar with the the Beat It video. So mm -hmm. you know, all I had to do was like just change a few things, tweak it here and there, and it was funny. Uh, and now you know, people are into the. Uh, their sub genres and whatever very specific mm -hmm. thing they're into. Uh, and there's so many options out there that, you know, there's certainly, there are still superstars and still hit songs, but it's not like everybody is aware of it in the same way that they were 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a couple questions as a writer, not, not of the music, but as screenplays? Cause we, I, that's the one area I feel like we, I'd like uh -huh. to, cause you, you co-wrote UHF, right? Yes. And you, and you co-wrote as well. Uh, the, the most, recent movie weird and so yeah. as i mean do you have aspirations as a screenwriter outside that um i'd like to do more i mean i i've i've never shied away from uh opportunities to work in feature films and tv and i, I would like to do more right i mean i i've enjoyed my music career and i don't want to give up on that but uh yeah I, i've always wanted to do more you know work you know i i enjoyed wor working with eric appel it was a, a a dream to to collaborate with him on a script and i like to do more with him um, were you in the room because it was covid was going on were you in a room together on zoom like how did it work did he come with ideas and bounce them off you or vice versa or you just like get together Together and we, we we wrote the outline together. This uh, the the outline was pre COVID, uh, and did we finish the? I don't I don't remember. It, it took us a while to sell us. I'm not sure if we wrote it during COVID or not. But I know that once we had the outline, uh, we divvied it up. And this was uh, Tom Lennon's a friend of mine, and, and Tom Lennon and Ben Garant wrote a screenwriting book. And there's a chapter in there about how to write with a partner, which I which I uh, read when I did UHF, which was not quite as fun <laughs> to write as the word was. But basically, once you have your outline, the 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 best thing to do I found uh, if you're working with a partner is to just divide it up. Like we divided the movie into. 12 or 22 chunks and yeah. I would write a chunk and Eric would write the next one and then he would like punch up my chunk and then I'd punch up his and we'd go oh, through the movie cool. and by the time the whole thing was done the movie had basically been rewritten 22 times so it was actually a pretty tight first draft did That's you get cool. notes from anyone or were people just happy to say like hey it's your movie because it's you and we yeah, we, we got notes. We, you know, um, Roku had a few notes, uh, but they, they were actually not bad, you know, because I was used to like network notes just being horrible and ridiculous. <laughs> and, yep. and, and, and we get a page of notes from them and we'd be like, yeah, OK, yeah, we can do that. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> and well, I was I was also wondering, like, so the casting of there are a million funny, fun cameos and obviously like getting Daniel Radcliffe as a coup. Did you personally go out and and try to cast that off of people you knew uh, and call in favors or were people just did you have a casting agent who found people were just receptive to it? I know you're big in the comedy world and have a lot of friends there. Well, we, we did have a, a casting director, but the, the pool party scene, I was sort of the unofficial casting person for that. Cause I just got to go through <laughs> yeah, my dress was... book and just pick out a bunch of my friends and see if they were going to be available on that specific day. So uh, yeah, I, I got to coordinate all that. I can't believe we pulled that off. I yeah. want to give you a, a compliment on your acting and both out my own stupidity that I was watching it with my wife and I said like, oh, who's that record executive? They look familiar and they're really funny. I was deep, deep into character. <laughs> yeah, you, really said, you idiot, that's weird Al. <laughs> like, because you wonder, we talk about it on the podcast all the time, like, I don't know that much about movies. I, I watch documentaries. So, so, like... I'm unable to see actors for something. Like I'm unable to, in my mind, connect people I know with. That, that is just suspend your disbelief. Yeah. That is a compliment. Yeah. Now, uh, Weird Al, we're going to let you go, but not without mm. our profound thanks. I yes. mean, this is this yeah. is huge for us. You have been huge for us for most of our lives. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for that. And, and continue to be with my kids, who I wish were home. They would, like, shit a brick. <laughs> right now. And yeah. They've been to your live shows. And it's. I think that's one of the great things we didn't talk about, but that you must get now, like, you know, we're bringing our kids to the show. We're all yeah. enjoying it together. That was the thing with a movie. I was watching it with my kids, and they, you know, they love foil. And, like, my youngest one has this whole thing where the reptiles and that scare her. So we put it on, and then they come on, and she screams, and we make fun of her, and then she comes out. So 
Uh, it's it's, it's not just us. It's like literally something that I'm able in the way that my parents passed along to me. Like, I like Scott Joplin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I'm passing on and sharing with them that we're all enjoying together. Uh, well, for, first of all, you're both just incredibly sweet. And also, yeah, it's, it's a very cool thing because when I came out in, in the early 80s, you know, my uh, my core audience was definitely like 12-year-old boys. <laughs> but then those boys grew up and now they're bringing their kids and yeah. sometimes their grandchildren. So that's, it's, a, it's a multi-generational uh, a fan base at this point. Well, it will. The, the songs will live on forever. The laughs just continue every time you put something out. So we, we hope you do again. Or if it's if it's screenwriting, uh, you know, obviously we will be uh, first online to see whatever it is. And again, thank you so much for being here. Weird Al Yankovic. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.